Welcome to another episode of the Cozy Cottage Crochet Podcast. My name is Hannah, and this is a podcast all about crochet, a little bit of knitting, sometimes sewing, and generally living the yarniest life possible in St. Petersburg, Florida, where I live. How are you? It's been three weeks since I was able to upload a podcast. I was planning on recording last week, but at the beginning of the week, my husband had a little bit of a cold and wasn't feeling very well. And then on the night that I was going to record, Nova fell off the couch, which I know all babies fall off of something at some point. Like I literally, for one second, I was like this, wiping my eye and she was on the floor. It wasn't that far. She's totally fine. But of course she screamed bloody murder. So that completely ruined the plans of recording that evening. And then the next night, our air conditioner wasn't working. So they, someone had to come out and they supposedly fixed it. And it was not working again the next day by noon. So <laughs> it was quite an adventure last week. It is currently eight in the morning. Nova just went down for her first nap. She's been up since six. So I have a small window of time to go ahead and do this. This is her sleeping. <laughs> um, if you hear any white noise, it's because she has a sound machine. And so I can't get rid of that entirely. So grab a beverage <laughs> and let's get going. Cause who knows how long we'll have before she wakes up. I if you're looking for me anywhere on the interweb, you can find me as the Cozy Cottage Crochet on Instagram. That's where I'm most active. You can also shoot me an email. We do have an email address set up specifically for this podcast. It is the Cozy Cottage Crochet at gmail.com. That is the best way to get a hold of me for anything related to the podcast specifically. Um, I do have one person who has not claimed their prize um, from the prizes I announced in the last episode. I believe that person is Eden's Crochet. You will have two more weeks to claim your prize. I did send you a message on Ravelry as well. Um, hopefully you can get this because I would love to mail that out. Everybody else's prizes has been mailed out and hopefully received. And yeah, it, if I don't hear back from you, then I will just put that prize back in the prize bin or see if I can draw another winner. Now, <laughs> I actually don't have anything to show you. I know. The horror. <laughs> what am I even going to talk to you about? Well, I have, I have not been working as much as you would think that I have for not having podcasted for three weeks, but I have been working on a project, but it's a secret project and I never do this. <laughs> I never have secret projects. I always share my design process, but I can't share this one with you. And you'll find out why later. But I, I have gone through, since we last spoke, about 200 grams of yarn. So I think that's pretty good for having a six-month-old baby and working full-time and trying to keep up with life stuff. So I've gone through about 200 grams of yarn. I just can't show you. I probably have at least another 200 more. At least. Maybe 250. 250 more grams of yarn to use. Um, it's a mini spade is what I'm doing. And so I've probably used 10... 10 skeins total, 10 little mini skeins. So I have wound some up in advance and here are the next ones coming in the lineup. <laughs> so um, I'm halfway through a mini skein. My project is over there. That's why I keep looking over there. But the next one will be this one and then this one and then this one, this one, this one. So, and then I will have to wind some more yarn because I'm not entirely sure how many minis this project will use. I think I've picked out enough. So once I've done with those, then I'm gonna start winding these. So it will go into more of like a bluish, purplish, green. And then if I need to, I will use these ones. I probably will need to, because I'm not getting quite as much yardage slash, <laughs> like I'm not getting quite as many stitches out of a mini as I want to. And Something really interesting I've noticed with mini skeins, because I've been using primarily two advent calendars. So one was from a homespun house and one was from five burrow yarns. And the yardage on these mini skeins seems to vary wildly. <laughs> like some of them are 21 grams, some of them are 25 grams of yarn. So, I mean, I'm definitely not complaining about getting more yarn, but that's kind of like weird. Have you noticed this on mini skeins that they're a little bit all over the place as far as yardage? So yeah, all my minis are living in this llama bag that came from a lovely viewer and patron of this podcast named Amanda. I love that llama bag very much. It's housing all of my minis and my secret project at the moment. So I can't show it to you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but I thought that um, I got a little bit of happy mail that I want to show you. And I figured for a few moments we can talk about the design process. That would be a fun topic for this podcast episode. Let me just reach over. I got... 
a message from Claudia, who is the founder of Crochet Luna. She makes amazing, amazing buttons. I will link her Etsy shop below. And where I got to see her in 2018, which honestly feels like years and years ago now. Someday we must get together again. Um, but she sent me this message. She has the Crochet Luna podcast and she was like, I'm cleaning out my craft room and I have an extra one of these books. Do you want it? And what this book is, is the Crochet Every Way Stitch Dictionary. And I was like, yeah, that looks very cool. So she sent that to me. She sent me a beautiful tea. I've never actually had tea pigs before, so I'm really excited to try them. I was almost going to drink this the other day and I was like, no, 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 no. I have to podcast and show it to you because I think it's cool. It It's 100% Rainforest, Rainforest Alliance Certified Tea, English Breakfast. So I'm excited about that. And these are beautiful, which these are immediately going on my secret project. These little butterfly stitch markers. They're gorgeous. They're from A Needle Runs Through It. They're so pretty. So I was waiting to show you those until, so I could use them. So she sent me this book. And this, I spent, I have spent hours when I'm too tired to crochet or too tired and I'm just like, oh, I just need a break. If the baby's sleeping at night, I will flip through this book. This is an amazing resource. So this is a book by Dora Orenstein. She is a fantastic crochet designer and pattern writer. And it tells you, so it has all kinds of like shaping and pattern repeats and like information at the beginning of the book. But one thing that is very, very fascinating about this book. So if you have a normal stitch dictionary, it may just have like a double crochet and you will get a square of double crochet, maybe a picture and a chart in the book and how to do the double crochet. But here she includes something amazing, which is increases, decreases and edge shaping. If you are a budding designer, let me do this. I mean, everyone knows how to do a double crochet, right? I don't think I'm giving away the secret sauce of this book. Uh, if you are a budding designer or you're thinking about wanting to design, this is the most valuable thing, the most valuable resource of all time. Because trying to figure out how to do internal shaping and external like edge increasing and decreasing is one of the things that is a mind bender for me. Maybe it's easy for you if you're a designer. I have to stop and really like focus and be like, okay, how am I gonna add enough stitches to get to another pattern repeat? It, it usually involves math. This book has how to do this and charts for how to do it for every single stitch. So for example, this is a bobble stitch. She shows you how to do, how to add enough stitches. Um, Here's another one, Pico Mesh. How to do internal and external shaping on that. It's incredible. And all of these have charts. Every single stitch has charts. And there are, there's so there's closed stitches, which is like solid fabric, mesh, filet, and, and lace, um, textured stitches, exploding shells, classic lace, and then finally, um, like ripples and things like that. So this is possibly the most fabulous book. I have a couple of stitch dictionaries that I like. Um, this one is top of the list now. I keep looking at it and getting so inspired. Like, look at this, this is on the back cover. This is that beautiful little flower stitch. Shows you how to add more. Highly, highly recommend. Claudia, this is such a great resource. <laughs> Thank you so much for sending this to me. So with that in mind, I wanted to think about the design process. So how do I come up with a design? I used to just be like, I'll just take the yarn and I'll just start crocheting. And that's fine, except that um, it's hard to replicate. And then you may not have enough yarn. <laughs> and once I finally decide what I'm settled on, it's just, I, I typically, I used to not swatch. It's all the stuff, all the math and swatching up front that most people don't like about designing. You just wanna take your hook and create, right? And that's how I used to be as well, except it just, it doesn't work as far as pattern production because then you end up having to make multiple samples. So what I am wearing is one of my favorite makes of all time. It is the first crochet pattern I ever released. It's still one of my most popular. I don't think it's the most popular anymore. It was for the longest time. This is the one that had the most downloads on Ravelry. Um, this is the Treasure Island Shawl. I think it has been surpassed by the You're Not Alone Cowl, which is a pattern that I released during the pandemic last year. Um, it's a super easy 
textured cowl in worsted weight yarn. Um, and it's specifically to like tell people they're not alone. So I think that that one has actually surpassed the Treasure Island shawl, but they're very close. These are by far my two favorite patterns. And this is the first one I ever did. So this is where I started with, I don't know what I'm making. <laughs> the yarn for this came from a lovely person named Lacey who has the Hooked on Owls podcast. She sent me this beautiful skein of yarn and I just picked up a hook and I started crocheting and I must have ripped out what side? This side. I think I started over here. Maybe I started over here. Yes, I started here. So I must have gotten like this far 20 times <laughs> before I settled on what I was doing. And it's a pretty simple pattern. If you know how to double crochet and chain, you can do this. So I made it in a variegated yarn. Lots of people have made it in solid colors and the lace panels really pop. So it has lace panels, it increases and then it decreases. It's perfect for Florida because it uses one big skein of yarn. I'd say it probably uses about 115 grams, 420 to 450 yards, depending on your gauge. Of course, you don't have to make this in one solid color if you want. I'll link this pattern below. But basically, I just picked up the hook. I started crocheting. This is what came out. I ended up having to make another one in worsted weight yarn and another one that I gave away because I had to do all the math and the gauge because I didn't do it up front. So I love this pattern, but the design process, like I didn't know what I was doing. It was the first one I ever released. That pattern has since gotten a revamp, not in the instructions because those were correct, but just to like freshen it up and make it look more the same as all of my other patterns that I've released. So that's the process that I followed is I just picked up a hook, started crocheting, made this up, scribbled down notes in a notebook, had to go back, figure them out <laughs> later. That is a tip if you're a budding designer, you must, you must write everything down. You will not remember. Let me say that again. <laughs> you will not remember. I swear to you, you will not remember. If you're like, oh, I'll know that I used a five millimeter hook, you won't. I promise you, you will not remember unless you are coming back to it the next day, even if you're coming back to it the next day. I have a design that I was working on um, that I just had to go back and like re-engineer because I could not, I started this before, like maybe three months into no, being pregnant with Nova. And I was like, of course, I'm gonna have this done, no big deal. I, and I was working on it all the time, so I knew what hook size I was using. Didn't write it down anywhere. It's been a year now <laughs> because I was pregnant, didn't work on it, then she was born, didn't work on anything. She's six months old now. Do I remember? Not a clue. I have no idea. So I've been swatching and trying to re-engineer it and it's a ridiculous. So get a notebook, make sure it's in there, write it down. Alternatively, get a notebook and write it down, um, but also use Google Docs on your phone. I am a big proponent of Google Docs because I can get to it on my phone, on my iPad, on my computer. I can access it from anywhere. So I highly recommend Google Docs. You're gonna to wanna to write down your gauge before and after blocking. You always wanna block your swatch. Make sure you swatch in like a good sized swatch. So for my secret project, here is a swatch. This is an entire mini skein. Does this look like one or two inches or four by four inches to you? No, this is 20 grams of yarn. Swatch largely especially if you are going to be making a large object. If you're making a shawl, it's not quite as important. You could maybe start the beginning of the shawl and use that as your swatch. So I could use, you know, the first triangle, triangular point up to maybe row 50 as my swatch and then just keep going. But if you're making a garment or a cardigan or a blanket, you need a big swatch. Otherwise your gauge may lie to you. So you must have a big swatch, you must block it. Write down your hook size. If you do multiple swatches, write down each one. Now, I wanna share with you the design process for this shawl, which I still have not blocked. <laughs> it has been um, over a month since I showed you this finished object. I still haven't blocked it. Maybe I'm gonna leave it out so I can block it. This is the Siri shawl. And I showed it to you a couple, two podcast episodes ago. It had just finished. I have, in fact, woven. <coughs> a cloud of dust just came off of this because it's been hiding in the corner. It needs, it desperately needs a wash. Whew, sorry, <laughs> all my ends have been woven in. I just don't like to trim them until after I block it. So here, the swatch that I did was actually the first part of this shawl. And you can tell, where is, let's see. You can tell this way because 
You see how the lace is really scrunched up over here and really open over here? That's because this corner has been blocked and that is how I knew my gauge. So the design process with the Treasure Island shawl was just pick up a hook, start crocheting. The design process with this is actually much more simple, <laughs> I would say, because I picked up the yarn, I found a stitch that I liked, I did a couple of swatches with this yarn, I kept just making it, ripping it out, doing it again until I was happy with the stitch pattern. Then I worked about 30 rows, 30, 40 rows-ish, however many inches this is, blocked it, did my measurements, wrote all of that down, and then I kept going. So I know exactly how many stitches are in this whole shawl by doing some math. Um, I know how big the shawl is going to be by doing some math up front. So I did this swatch and I just started doing some multiplying. So I'm like, if I get this many rows per four inches, that means I get, let's, these are random numbers. I'm just making them up. But let's say I get 10 rows per four inches. That means I get 2.5 rows per one inch. Therefore, if I, and then I figured out how many stitches per gram I could get. And then I always add like 10% because you know, you want to make sure my gauge is a little tight. I don't want people to run out of yarn. So given that I, was like, okay, how many stitches can I get out of this whole shawl? And that equals X amount of inches. And I'm pretty spot on. When this is blocked, I think it's gonna be perfect. Because I started, I picked a stitch pattern, I picked the yarn, I did my swatch, I made some notes. Now I don't have the pattern written for this <laughs> yet. I actually, instead of making notes, because this one just came out like so beautifully, I have only a a handwritten chart <laughs> on this, but I will be able to write this pattern up. Should be fairly easily. And then it's going to be a nice lacy Florida shawl. It takes two skeins of fingering weight yarn. This is the next one that I want to work on. I currently have a cowl out to testers that should be done. I wanna get that back from testers by the end of July so that I can release that. Um, this is the next one that I wanna work on. It's just that time is like oh, so hard to find. Working full time with a baby, <laughs> it's so hard to find. Like it's been 17 minutes since I started recording and I, always, I'm, I feel like I'm rushing already. So that's kind of the design process. So let's say maybe you get this book, you're a budding designer, what do you wanna do? You could flip through I'm a big fan of stitch dictionaries. Let's say you want to use this stitch. It's called boxed blocks. And you're like, yes, this stitch is just so cool. That is exactly the look I'm going for. And I have the perfect yarn for it. You get your hook out, you start swatching, you find the perfect hook size that gives you the drape that you want to. You make, so let's say you do two swatches. One of them is perfect. Great, you block it. Then you kind of can know what shape you want. So let's say I'm going to do a triangular shawl, I would follow this <laughs> increase pattern. Um, if I wanted to do something that increased from the middle, I would follow this one. And then you write all of that down. So that's kind of the process. Let's say I wanted to do, where's more lace? Classic lace. Here's one. Oh, that's an interesting one. It's called leafy. This would make such a cute wrap right? Just, and you wouldn't even have to increase necessarily. You could do straight up and down on this one that's called leafy. And I could be like, okay, that's a beautiful stitch pattern. I have this idea of what it's going to look like. I go through my stash, be like, what kind of yarn will fit into this? Alternatively, you can start with the yarn, say, let's, maybe I have like this beautiful purple yarn. And I'm like, I just think it would be so pretty if I could find a stitch and you go looking for a stitch pattern to match it. Match those two together do a swatch, then do your math. So let's say I get 10, I, let's say I get 20 stitches per four inches and 10 rows, perfect. So now I know that if I want my wrap to be this wide, let's say 10 inches wide, then I'm gonna need to multiply how many stitches I get. So if I get 20 stitches per four inches, that means I get five stitches per inch. So if I need it to be 10 inches wide total, I'm after blocking, I'm gonna need to multiply five by 10. So it'll be 50 stitches wide. If I want it to be 100 inches long, which would be way too long for a wrap, but round numbers are easier for math. And I get 10 rows. Now let's do, I'm gonna make this math easier. <laughs> if I get, 
12 rows per four inches, that would be three rows per inch, okay? So if I wanted to be 100 inches long, and I get three rows per inch, then I know I need to make 300 rows before the, the piece will be done. That's how I do it. Um, and you, you're welcome to look at any of my patterns. I have like a bunch of them. <laughs> and I, they're pretty much, they're written in a very similar style. Um, and when you're writing a pattern, you also wanna make sure that you have gauge information in the pattern. How many stitches per inch? How many rows per inch? Hook size, notions, what do you need? Um, don't assume people always know what you're talking about. If you're using a technique that's pretty strange, make sure you include a link. Um, include definitions for your abbreviations. There's nothing worse than going to a pattern and being, it's like um, HHDC 72. Okay, what is an HHDC? <laughs> Put a pattern key in your pattern. It's a herringbone half double crochet. Boy, but I would have had to Google that, which means I'm leaving your pattern to find the information, which means people, people are gonna be a little frustrated. So at least have that pattern key. Make some notes um, so that people have an idea of how it's worked. Is it worked from the bottom up? Is it worked side to side? Is it worked top down? Is it worked in the round? Is it worked in continuous spirally rounds or is it turned rounds back and forth? So all of that, is it, if it's a garment, like is it top down with minimal seaming? Is it made in pieces and seamed together? Give your people the knowledge of what, how the pattern is constructed up front. And then I also always like to try to include a schematic so that you can have some, like, for this, it would literally just be like a long triangle. <laughs> it's really easy. And then you can put the measurements, finished measurements on the schematic. What else, what else? I knew there was something else I wanted to tell you and now I don't remember what it is. <laughs> a schematic, oh, yes I do, pictures. I cannot tell you how many patterns I have seen that have like one dinky little photo <laughs> of the finished object and it, there's no close up, there's no person wearing the object, it's just flat. Like, give me some photos, put them everywhere in the pattern. You don't have to be like every page is a photo and they don't have to be like super artsy, styly photos. But like, if I'm, having this shawl, like I want people to have a picture of me wearing the shawl so they, they can see what it looks like. And I wanna at least try to have a picture of it spread out. Sometimes that's really difficult with a big shawl to get it in the whole photo. Um, so you could do a flat lay or you could hold it out. This is where the schematic comes in handy as well. But like try to get the whole piece flat in a photo or on a body um, or stretched out and then make sure you have someone wearing it so we can see what it looks like. And then if there's any interesting stitch details, anything like that, like make sure you have a close up so that people can be like, oh, that's really pretty, that's really cool. And lastly, make sure you put your name on it. <laughs> like put your Instagram, put your social media, you want people to link back to you for the pattern. So I don't know if that was helpful, <laughs> but I thought it would be a fun topic because I, I, I really love designing, I'm really passionate about designing, and I am so behind on designs. Like literally this Siri shawl, I have the Spiral Up Cowl that is currently in testing. That's made with beautiful yarn on the Prairie yarn. It's been such a long process to get this cowl to the point of being ready. So that one is in testing. There is a Tunisian cowl the sample is done, the pattern is not written, made out of beautiful attic spin dye yarn. I have to think of a name for that one still. I have the Queerly Beloved Cowl, which is a um, triangular cowl made in pride yarn with some hearts. I have to completely rework the cable hearts because they're just not working. I, I sent it out to testers and had to pull it back because the pattern was not ready. And you know, sometimes that happens, but that was before Nova was born, so it hasn't been touched. So that's three patterns. I have the Siri Shawl, that's four. I have an Ascidian Cardigan, that's five. Um, that one isn't going to be too hard. I don't think it's just a lot, a lot of crocheting. Um, so I'm only like 30% of the way through that one. And then what else? I have the secret project. So six patterns are in progress. I feel like I might be missing one, but it, five or six, five to seven patterns are in progress. And I'm just, you know, I'm going slow. I'm going real slow, but I'm really excited to have the spiral up cowl out to you at the beginning of August, probably the second week in August. So look out for that. Um, and this series shawl is the next one I'm going to work on because it's just, I'm excited about it. And then I did get <laughs> a lovely card from my friend, Emmy, who is also a patron. 
she sent me some tea, but I wanted to show you this little sticker she sent me. She sent me one of Allie from Little Drops of Wonderful, her stickers that says, you are a little drop of wonderful. And I am trying to decide where I wanna put this. I kinda wanna put it on my water bottle, but my water bottle tends to go through the washing machine, uh, the washing machine, <laughs> the dishwasher. A dishwasher is a washing machine, right? So I don't know if I wanna put it on there cause it's probably gonna like melt off. So I may end up putting it, I don't know, on my iPad case or something where I wanna see it every day because I just love, I love that little pin. And of course, I dropped it on the floor because every single episode, I drop something on the floor. Y'all know this. Okay, it's been 25 minutes. <laughs> I don't have any other yarny content to share with you. Um, I, the baby should still be sleeping for about another 20, 30 minutes, hopefully. Um, and then we have to go because I have to work. I have a meeting out of the house, so I have to get her up, feed her, and run. But um, if you're here for the yarny content, I'm done with it. <laughs> I don't have any more. But I know that a lot of you resonated with, appreciated, connected with my podcast episode, the first one, when I came back last time, um, about my birth experience with Nova and the, the postpartum experience and how difficult it was. Um, and one thing that I didn't really talk about is feeding her, um, mostly because it's a pretty sensitive subject for me. Um, but I know that so many of you, like I got so many comments, so many emails, so many messages. Thank you so much for like sharing your experience with me of people saying that was me too. And now I know I, I don't feel so alone, whether it was 20 years ago that you had a little baby um, and you felt alone then, or you just had a little baby or you're about to have a little baby. You know that it's not all rainbows and sunshine and it's okay to be exhausted and to think that you can't do it and all your baby needs is you. So I know that that, it was difficult for me to get out <laughs> all of that, but it was helpful to a lot of people. And one of the things I tr always try to do here on this podcast is be honest and be authentic um, as much as I am able to be and as much as I'm comfortable sharing. So I want to share with you in case it will resonate with you or help someone else, my feeding journey with Nova. And I am probably going to get emotional about this. So just warning you. Now, if this is like a trigger subject for you or really sore sensitive subject, um, that's totally fine. You don't have to watch this. Don't feel like you have to. Um, and also, I just want to say up front, I know everybody has a lot of opinions on how you should feed your baby. And those are fine. But if anyone leaves a nasty comment, I will delete it. Um, I don't have any room or emotional energy for that. Y'all are the best, most supportive, most wonderful community. It is so, so rare that I have to delete a comment um, or, you know, make something hidden because someone's being mean. I think like one time in the last six months. So I don't expect there to be anything, but sometimes the most well-intentioned comments um, aren't received that way. And I, just please be aware that feeding a baby is a very sensitive subject for a lot of people. And so you can't just comment and be like, well, you should do it this way because it doesn't work like that. So please just remember to be gentle <laughs> and kind, um, not just for my sake, but for the sake of any moms or new moms who are gonna be reading this and already are dealing with insecurities or stress about this so, so that they can have maybe a weight lifted off of them. So. I'm just gonna start at the beginning and we'll see how far we get. When Nova was born, my goal was to breastfeed her for six weeks. I have heard some horror stories about nursing and I really didn't know if I was gonna be able to do it. And then she was born and she got sucked out with a vacuum because she got stuck. So she had a little cone head for a few days and her chin was pushed back. So she had a super hard time latching. Like she would try, but she couldn't really like do this motion because her poor little chin was back further than it should have been. So the lactation consultants had to come in like every single time that I was trying to nurse her for the whole three days we were in the hospital. And they pretty much just like grab your boob like a hamburger and like mash it into the baby's face. And they're, they're like way rougher than I was like, can you do that? So I never would have made it out of the hospital, I don't think, without them because she couldn't latch and she would just cry and cry like one time. Um, the lactation consultant wasn't, it was in the middle of the night. I don't think they were like immediately available. So I was trying to do it myself for 20 minutes. She couldn't latch and she was just crying and screaming It's because she was hungry and she was a teeny, tiny, tiny, tiny baby, like seven pounds. Um, 
if she didn't know what she was doing, I didn't know what I was doing. And the lactation lady came in 20 minutes later and thankfully helped us latch. But like if I had had, if I had just been sent home without those people, I never would have made it. So it's pretty uncomfortable nursing, let me tell you. For the first several weeks, two to three weeks, it, it was not comfortable every time she nursed, uh, especially because of her chin situation. Um, and the lactation consultant at the hospital, everyone's like, it shouldn't hurt you. That is a lie. It will hurt you the first couple of weeks. It's not gonna be like excruciating, mind-blowing pain like childbirth. And that's honestly what I kept thinking is, I birthed this baby from my body, I can handle this <laughs> because it will settle down. Like it doesn't hurt the whole time, but every time she would latch, it would hurt for weeks. So, and I had to like, you know, track how much she was eating and make sure she was eating every few hours, make sure she gained weight back. And then some like at night, like in the evenings, I know it's a witching hour for a lot of babies. She just would fight so hard for a long time. And I, I should have gotten another appointment with a lactation consultant before I did. But I kept thinking like, is this normal? Like, am I doing something wrong? Like she would just, and she was so gassy and so refluxy. So like, it's not her fault, she's in pain. But we were locked essentially in this battle of like, she didn't want to nurse, but she was hungry. So she would cry and then she would get too hungry and start screaming. And like a couple of times I had to hand her to my husband so he could give her a bottle of milk that I had pumped because she couldn't calm down enough to eat. Um, and then when she would eat, like I had to have a pacifier, especially in the evenings, she would nurse for a few minutes and then cry. And then I put a pacifier in her mouth and it was not a milk issue. Like I made plenty of milk, plenty. Um, it was just with her stomach issues, um, and her gas and I, I just, we seem to be fighting each other a lot. So it was really difficult. <laughs> and another thing that was difficult is I had pumped, I had started pumping to kind of try and, you know, build my milk supply up. And so I would pump in the morning after she would nurse and I would pump at night before bed. And so I had gotten probably... Uh, I want to say like almost 200 ounces in the freezer because I just had this fear of like, what if something happens to me with all of her stomach issues, switching her to formula, like there's no milk in the fridge. Like I, I had this like anxiety about I have to pump and I have to build up this freezer stash because if something happens to me, she's not going to have any food or even if we switch to formula, um, that'll just be worse for her stomach. And I just can't do that to her. Like it's my job to like feed her. It's a, I understand looking back that that's like, what, a, what an anxiety to have. Like obviously nothing has happened to me. And if something did happen to me, my husband would feed her formula. She would be fine. I didn't need to have this massive freezer stash, but I got almost 200 ounces. And then, um, because she was nursing all the time, I defrosted one to like feed her at church on a Sunday and she wouldn't drink it. And I was like, why? Like, I don't understand. She doesn't want a bottle. It's this whole thing. It smelled very strange, the milk. And I was like, oh my God, is it spoiled? Like did our freezer, like everything else in our freezer is frozen. I don't understand what's happening. So apparently I have an, a high amount of an enzyme called lipase that makes the milk taste like soap. It's like kind of metallic. It doesn't smell great. And she was like, oh no, <laughs> I am not drinking that. And it only activates like the longer it's frozen or the longer it's stored. So the stuff that had been in the freezer the longest smelled the strongest. She would not drink it. And I, oh, I pretty much, that was like the worst day, I think. Like I cried all day because that's a huge, it was hours and hours of pumping, hours. And plus nursing her was a struggle, not in the middle of the night and not in the morning. Like those were the really sweet times, but from the afternoon on, it was always a struggle to nurse her. And now I've lost my whole freezer stash. So I, I basically cried all day. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, so there is a way around that. So I kept pumping. You just have to boil your milk essentially before you freeze it and kill that enzyme. So you have to bring it to like 180 degrees. So I started doing that. I was able to donate all of that milk, 190 ounces 
91, I think, to a milk bank in Florida. I went through their screening process because babies in the NICU a lot of times have feeding tubes. Um, and some babies don't care, I guess, that it tastes like that. Nova cared. <laughs> and I would have cared too, honestly. It smelled very weird. But I was able to at least donate that. So, you know, some little baby <laughs> who's in the NICU with a feeding tube is not even going to taste it, but it's still going to get all of the nutrients and everything from that milk that maybe they wouldn't have gotten. So it's not a complete loss. And I'm very grateful that I was able to donate. But ooh, that was hard. Like that was a big setback. And then I had extra panic. Like, well, now I've lost my whole freezer stash. She won't drink it. So I have to start over. So then I like kept pumping and kept pumping and kept pumping. And or, like, we just, she would just fight me on nursing at night and kick and flail around and cry. And finally, especially during this whole time, I had been going to work with her and she started not wanting to nurse at work and just screaming. And like, not all the time, but it was getting really, really difficult. She has never nursed in public. I don't care. I will nurse in public. I'll put a cover on, whatever. She won't do it. She's too distracted. She just, when she was really, really small, I was able to do it a few times. But as soon as she could like see further than a foot, definitely not. And I just didn't, I was like at the end of my rope, like, I would say 70% of my stress around being a mom was feeding her. And I'm looking back on it and talking about it now. And I'm just like, why, first of all, why did I not get help sooner? And second of all, why was that my anxiety? Ooh, I'm going to cry. Mm. And third of all, I'm just going to oh, fan those tears on my ass. So why didn't I get help? Why did I think like that that was my anxiety that I had to have this freezer full of milk in case I died? I don't know. Um, but also why I was so, so, so attached to having to nurse her. So I finally like, I had a friend who's a doula who I was not able to use <laughs> because they, the hospital wouldn't let anybody in except my husband. And we weren't allowed to leave, so I wasn't allowed to bring anyone with us. But I um, I texted her and I was like, do you know any lactation consultant? So she recommended one who turned out to be the most fabulous person of all time. I should have, I wish I had had her when, it, when Nova was a month old. Maybe the whole experience would have been different. But she is the first person who actually sat down with me and was like, what do you want? Because I was... I mean, I was days away from quitting. <laughs> like, it was like a last ditch effort. Like, if this doesn't help. <sighs> like, if this doesn't help, then we're just going to formula. Because I can't physically do this. I can't mentally do this anymore. It's just too much. And so she, as she sat down with me and was like, well, what do you want? Because everyone else was telling me like, one person told me just switch to formula. It's no big deal, which didn't feel right because it felt like a huge deal to me. And then pretty much everyone else in my life was saying, just nurse her. <laughs> Breast is best. And I'm like, well, this doesn't feel best either because we're just like, sometimes it's great, especially in the middle of the night. Those feedings are really, really great. Um, in the morning, she eats really well, but from about noon on until she goes to bed, they just get progressively harder to feed her. Oh God, <sighs> I'm too emotional about this. Maybe I should have waited another two weeks. <laughs> before trying to talk about this on a podcast. But she asked me like, what do you want? And I was like, truly what I want right now is to be able to nurse her. Because I love it when she is in the middle of the night and she's so sweet and she like makes all her little sounds and I can smell her sweet head. And it's just like, she is so sweet 
then <laughs> when she's not crying and kicking and flailing and she's like okay so I think this was at month four um and I was like I want to nurse her till she's six months old that's my goal <clears throat> and she's like okay we can do this so we made a plan she helped me out like immensely <laughs> Um, it was still pretty rough for the first week after that because we, Nova and I were just like so used to, like I think she was so used to fighting me on it and I just stopped fighting her. Like if she didn't want it, she didn't want it, no big deal. Um, and so slowly like the stress level began to go down and I would say about month five. It started being enjoyable again. The last feeding of the day has, was always so hard, which is like a 6, 7 p.m. feeding. Um, she would always still, no matter what. She wasn't fighting me anymore on it, but she would cry. She would nurse and she would cry and she would kick and like, she never got like up to here like she used to, but it just wasn't pleasant. So like finally it became a fairly good experience. And then I left my job at the office the law office where I worked and I was home with her um, <sighs> and I started feeling like I kind of want to transition her a little bit because now I have at least when I when I was working at the law office it was incredibly stressful to have to take her there with me and try to feed her there but she at least recognized that place so she would eat at home and she would eat there and then at church on Sundays she would get a bottle of milk that I had pumped um, but now I have meetings out of the house with people and she will not, she will not nurse in public. And even the lactation consultant was like, she probably never will. Like, this is just who she is. She, something about it feels uncomfortable to her. She's not going to nurse in public. You need to stop trying to make her <laughs> because you're just going to be fighting each other. And that's not a good experience for either of you. So if you're out in public, just take a bottle. But I loathe pumping. When I say I loathe pumping, I mean, if I could burn my pump in a fire, I would. I'm not going to, just in case I need it in the future, sometime, if we ever have another baby. <laughs> but I loathe pumping. Um, probably because I pumped so much. I think I pumped too much. So the struggle is, if I'm out in public with her, she needs to eat, I give her a bottle, I still then have to pump. Which means I'm out in public, I can't do it. So it's like, what am I supposed to do? I don't know. Um, and I don't want to pump anymore. So I started by dropping the nighttime pumping session. Or no, I dropped the morning one because I would always pump after she ate the first time. So I dropped that and I was like, wow, that's pretty great. Not pumping in the morning. And then I started, then I got mastitis because she would just yank and be aggressive. <laughs> it's the only way I can say, I don't wanna give you like TMI, but I got mastitis. So I was on antibiotics for that. And it's just been, that was like a ridiculous thing. So then you, you know, you must keep nursing so that it doesn't go terribly wrong. So I nursed through mastitis and like a clogged, two clogged ducts, I think. Finally got through all of that. I dropped that morning pumping session. And then I was trying to drop the evening pumping session, which I did. And then we, I started having meetings out of the house and it became really difficult to pump in the afternoon. Like I, I pumped in my car a few times, like while driving and she hates the car seat. And so that was just kind of a mess. And finally I was like, what if I just gave her a bottle of formula? What if I just gave her a bottle of formula? Like while I'm out, would it be that big of a deal? And it felt like a huge deal to me. It felt really, really intense, but I tried it. I was like, well, I can just give her the one bottle and not pump. I can drop that one feed. I gave her like a 50-50 milk and formula mix bottle when she was a week before she was six months old. So I fed her exclusively until then. Um, she didn't even bat an eye, okay? Like didn't even notice. And I was like offended. I, it's not her fault, right? But I was like offended. I was like, are you serious? Like I've been beating myself up about this for six months, like thinking formula is gonna ruin your life. You didn't even care at all that 
you had formula in your bottle. So the next day I gave her a full formula, no reaction. She like liked it just as much as she liked nursing for me. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I was gonna keep doing that, just one formula bottle a day for a while. But I think I got to the point where I was ready to be done. Um, oh, I'm gonna cry again. <laughs> It's really difficult to say because you feel so guilty. You're like, because this messaging you get is breast is best. It's best for the baby. You know, you, you gotta do what's best for the baby. But also what's best for the baby is having a not stressed out parent. <laughs> so, um, I started feeling like I really just wanted to wean her. Like that it would be better for me, for my mental health. It would be better for her because I would be enjoying being with her and feeding her more. Um, it would be so much easier because we can go out. I can feed her a bottle with no problem. She will drink a bottle anywhere. I won't have to pump. And I am not pumping. I will not be an exclusively pumping person because I cannot handle that. Um, and I cried about it for like two weeks. And I kept thinking like, I'm giving up. <sighs> like after all the struggles, <sighs> it's finally like we're finally in a groove. She's finally not fighting me on nursing anymore. And now I'm gonna give up. Like this is when I'm gonna give up is when it's finally working. Like that just made me feel more guilty. Um, and I wanted to like ask a few people for their opinion. I spent hours scrolling the internet. I just didn't feel any peace about it. And finally I was like, okay, I actually don't need other people's approval. I don't. I might need other people's cooperation if they're going to be feeding the baby. <laughs> I might need them, you know, their cooperation with it, but I don't need other people's approval. What the only person I need to convince about this is myself. I need to be convinced that I'm making the right decision for me and for her. And so I just started thinking about that. And then maybe another few days went by and I really like felt in my being, like I am ready to be done with this. And so I've started weaning her. So I would say over in the last month, we have gone from nursing six, seven times a day. We're down to one now, one in the morning. Um, and I will be dropping that soon. I almost made her a bottle this morning and I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready for yesterday to be the last time that I had nursed her. So I nursed her again because I'm still making, you know, enough to feed her in the morning. So um, she's been doing great. Her stomach has not been any worse because of formula. In fact, I think it's been a little better. She no longer poops herself awake at 5 a.m. every morning, which is fantastic. Um, so she will be on formula exclusively, probably in another week or two. And I will be able to wear a regular bra for the first time in months and months and months and months which is exciting. I'll be able to put my pump away for good and not stress out about it. So I've been, I have another 200 ounces in the freezer cause I was so obsessive about pumping after the first time it didn't work. Um, so I've been giving her like four bottles of formula, three or four a day and two milk. So she'll still have some milk for a while, but that's kind of been our journey. Um, and I, oh gosh, <laughs> I'm almost out of time. I gotta hurry this up. I need to wake her up because we have to leave. Like we have to leave the house for a meeting very shortly. Um, what I want to say is if you're a new mom or you're pregnant and you hear this, the only person you have to convince is yourself. You are just as important as your baby. And if it gets to a place where you are so stressed about feeding her or him, that it's affecting like your quality of life, it's affecting your sleep, it's affecting your, your relationship with your baby. If it's more harmful than helpful, just 
it's okay. <laughs> it is okay to not do it. For whatever reason you may not want to nurse, it's a valid reason. Is it because it was a struggle? Because you didn't make enough milk? Because uh, you just don't want to? Because there's too much going on in your life? Because you're working and you don't want to pump? Because you need your partner to be able to feed the baby in the middle of the night while you get some sleep? For a million reasons, they're all valid. You have the ability to decide what's best for you and your baby. It doesn't mean you're not gonna have a lot of emotions about it. As you can see, I still have a lot of emotions about it. But I will tell you, this past two weeks where I have been mostly feeding her bottles and not nursing her has been the most stress-free of her whole life so far. Like it's been so easy. I have been present in every feeding session. And I would think like she would, we miss that bonding. No, she does the exact same things. She tries to get her hand in my mouth. She strokes my face. She does this on my shoulder. She holds my finger. I get to smell her sweet little head. Like she makes the same noises. It's just as beautiful of a bonding experience, giving her a bottle as it was nursing with a little less stress. So um, if whatever you have to do, if you want to breastfeed your baby, do it. <laughs> if you want to formula feed your baby, do it. Um, and if you're a person who currently is not nursing or having a newborn and you're a support person for someone who is, please hear me. Saying breast is best does not help because sometimes it doesn't feel best. <sighs> it doesn't feel like it's working. It just feels stressful and overwhelming. Um, but then alternatively saying fed is best also doesn't help. And I have been guilty of this. <sighs> because I know that I've said fed is best to other people who have been switching to formula. It doesn't help either because fed doesn't always feel best because maybe your goals have not been met or maybe you had a different idea of what nursing would be like or feeding your baby would be like. What moms need is support. Support is best. And one person that I talked to said the most beautiful thing to me um, cause I know she has a bunch of kids and she like nursed them all. So I was like, really like, oh my gosh, am I really going to tell this person that I'm switching to formula? She's going to think I'm like giving up. And all she said to me was something like, Hmm, it really seems like you have a lot of feelings about this and it's a really difficult decision. You're the only one that can decide. And I just want you to know you're a great mom. Whatever you decide, you're still a great mom. Nova's got a great mom. That's all I needed to hear. I know everyone has their opinions about what's best for the baby, um, but really what moms need is someone to say, you're a great mom. However you choose to feed your baby, however you are able to feed your baby, you're a great mom and I support you and you're allowed to have all the feelings about it. I'm still having all the feelings about it. But you know what? I feel free. <laughs> and I don't regret nursing her at all. We had some beautiful, beautiful moments together. And I don't regret that I'm changing her to formula because we'll have beautiful moments together then too. So I have to end this <laughs> because I have to leave the house. And I've got to feed her first. Um, so I know this is like a weird emotional note to end on, but just know if you're a new mom, you are the only person you have to convince. And you are a great mom. You feed your baby however you need to. And it's okay to have all the emotions about it. Um, and for everyone else, moms just need support. That's all moms need is support for how they feed their baby. And if you are a new mom and you want to nurse, I beg you, if you're having any issues, get a good lactation consultant. If you get one and they're like overbearing or like telling you a certain way, get another one. There are beautiful, amazing lactation consultants who can save your life when you're nursing. Don't wait, don't be like me and wait till month four of struggling. Get one immediately. You, you deserve to feel empowered in how you are feeding your baby. Uh -huh. So hopefully <laughs> this was helpful to someone. It's not just me like crying to the internet. Um, if not, oh well, <laughs> it's going on the internet anyways. Hopefully next time I will have like some actual yarn content to show you. Maybe not though, because I'm working on that secret project, but I hope to be back in two weeks. 
thank you so much for being here, for sticking with me. Thank you, huge thank you to my patrons um, who have kept me going this whole time that I have been off the air on YouTube, but have still been uploading content for them. Um, we're having our patron Zoom meeting tonight <laughs> for the month of June, which I'm really, really excited about to sit and chat with some of those beautiful ladies. Um, so yeah, thank you to you all. Thank you to my patrons and I will see y'all in two weeks. Until then, please remember to be kind to yourself and happy crafting. Bye friends.